right, what's up, everybody? How we doing? Welcome to Saint Con, day one. Are we surviving? Heck yeah! It is so good to be back with you. It's so great to be back in person. I missed all y'all faces. So today we're gonna have some fun. Um, I have been kind of slacking a little bit on this whole pandemic thing, but I still made a little box for y'all to check out today. So. Welcome to my presentation. Uh, today I'll be talking about what's up here on the stage. After I talk, you can come up and ask me questions, or we might go out in the hallway. I don't know where I'm at in the lineup. If there's somebody after me, we'll go to the back and, and talk about it. But I'm going to give you the details of what's in this little box here. I know you're probably like, oh, hey, dude, where's that big Christmas tree looking thing? And I'm like, this is the future, people. This is the future. This is a Wi-Fi crack and light, yes, now with less calories, so let's jump right into this. So who am I? Uh, I go by Dark Matter on the internet. Um, I'm a dad of uh, two little hackers uh, in training, so working my way with them. Uh, and then I've got, uh, uh, do a little bit of uh, cybersecurity research, if you will. Uh, do some freelance, also do some development. If you didn't know this about me, I'm uh, a little obsessed with the wireless. Uh, I am the creator of the Wi-Fi Cactus, the Wi-Fi Kraken, the Wi-Fi Kraken Lite. Um, I do have a computer science degree from Southern Utah University, so go T-Birds. Uh, I love to run, I love to mountain bike, I love to snowboard. I'm so looking forward to the snowboard season and the early snow so far, let's hope it carries on. We could definitely use the moisture. Uh, and yeah, like I said, on, on Twitter, if you want to follow me on the Twitters, um, Sometimes I post useful things, mostly it's just random brain dumps. All right, so what are you in for today? Today, I've got for you the Wi-Fi crack and light details. So we're gonna break it all down, we're gonna get into the nitty gritty, but first we're gonna give you a little history, a history lesson on how I got here, kind of my mindset. Because at the end of this, I want every single one of you to think like you could build this yourself or build something better because Heavens knows I'm not the best one at this, and believe me, we're going to see some pretty rad stuff through this talk. Uh, next, we'll, And then after that, we'll talk about the datas, a little bit of datas. We'll do some live data demos. Uh, I've got the Kraken hooked up via the magic of USB 3.0, and we'll see if that all goes through and see if we can do some live demos. Another thing that I want to do this year, uh, that's really important to me is talking about what the community's doing. So I'm going to show you some of the cool stuff that the community's doing, the war driving community at large, and hopefully even inspire you more to get out, go sniff wirelesses, uh, and figure out what's going on in the, the wireless around you. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about what's the future, what's next. Uh, as Mike so eloquently pointed out, I'm missing LEDs on this. So we already got that one on the list. Got to add LEDs. Okay. So what is this thing, the Wi-Fi crack and light? How do we get here? A little bit of a history lesson for you. So this is how it started for me. Um, I was going down to DEF CON, I think it was like 2014, 13, 14, I don't know. The past all blends together at this point. I don't know how you guys are with, with memory and stuff, but it's all blending together. But basically what happened is, is I had this idea, people always said that the DEF CON conference was the most dangerous, crazy wireless network in the world. And I was like, why do people say that? Like, I believe you, but I don't. <laughs> so I'm kind of a skeptic to begin with. So I was like, I'm gonna build a tool to be able to do this. So this was just a single board computer uh, that had uh, some wireless radios attached to it, um, threw some alphas into it, hooked it up to a battery, put it in a box, and threw it in my backpack and started carrying around. Also, uh, I did make this little prototype wireless um, uh, wrist mount so that I could control it and get some information from it over Wi-Fi, so I was flooding myself with all the signals. So then, after that happened, after I created that box, that box, I started talking to people about that project and the data. I actually did, I think I did a SyncCon talk that year. I'm pretty sure I did a SyncCon talk after I went to DEF CON uh, about that little box project. And then uh, that morphed into a bigger project um, uh, through the help of uh, Comf and uh, Warthog. I was able to get uh, sponsored from Intel, and they were able to give me a bunch of Intel uh, Atom boxes, single board computers. And I turned that into 12 remote nodes. And so these are plugged into the wall, AC powered boxes. Uh, each of them had three radios in them. They had 802.11 and alpha radios 
plug those in throughout the conference, and then it was like getting fixed uh, wireless monitoring at the, the conference. So it did some monitoring at Black Hat, did some monitoring uh, at DEF CON, also did monitoring here at Saint Con. So uh, if you want, you can go back and look at the YouTubes for the Saint Cons and see some of my past talks uh, about some of the fun wireless projects over the years. But this project I felt was really successful. I was able to get a lot of data. Uh, we were getting distributed data, but the, the nodes were in fixed places. And so what that meant is people, as they were walking past the nodes, we were able to track them as they moved like room to room and area to area. So it became like a really neat uh, e example of what you could do when you add monitoring in fixed node locations. So like, let's say for your office, you wanted to add, bring your own device policies. You think somebody's sneaking a cell phone in the front door that's not allowed on your network. It all of a sudden shows up beaconing at the front door and you watch it and it sits down in a cubicle in your main bullpen. And next thing you know, it's like, oh, Somebody's breaking the bringing your own device policy, and that's something that we could essentially demonstrate with this pro with this. And this is just all the off-the-shelf gear. So this is like only a few thousand dollars. We were able to implement this all using open source wireless um, hardware, software, and 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 a few thousand dollars in hardware. So uh, pretty cool stuff you can do. So that morphed into, because I'm like, oh, well, I got 12, well, technically 36 radios, but they're all spread out. And all the data that came back kind of fragmented. It had problems. So I was actually at ShmooCon, um, and I was talking to Darren Kitchen, the, the founder of Hack5, and I was like, you know what would be really cool is if I could just monitor everything at once. And he's like, how many devices would you need to do that? And I'm like, I don't know. But I think like 25 or 30 would be awesome uh, radios. And next thing I know, 25, uh, a box of 25 Hack 5 pineapples uh, showed up at my door. Uh, he shipped me 25 pineapple tetras. So each of those had two wireless radios in them, 802.11n, uh, for a total of four antennas. And so this thing was a monster. It went through a few revisions. I made some changes to it. Um, over the years, I increased the switches. This is the original, the original design that had a lead acid battery, which was <laughs> the dumbest thing I ever did in one of my designs. But hey, you can go to an auto parts store and buy lead acid batteries. You can't go to the auto parts store and buy lithium ion. Um, but <laughs> and also, I could buy five lead acid batteries for what I paid for the lithium ions in the upgrade. Um, anyways, it's all just improvements over time. Uh, and so this solved the problem, but it was limited on runtime, but then I fixed it, but it was still limited on runtime. This thing weighed a little bunch. It wasn't super, uh, it wasn't super uh, mobile. Uh, and also this thing I've taken all over the world. I've taken it to China. I took it to Japan. I took it to Romania. I took it to the Bahamas. I took it to a bunch of places, and it was two carry-on cases that I had to fly with to be able to get this thing anywhere I went. Um, which is awesome and, and, and a feat in of itself. But after you do that for a few years, you start looking at options to make things smaller. So I had this idea of, okay, well, I'm going to make a small case that has stuff in it. Well, small was kind of a relative term. Uh, the screen in this display is actually a 24-inch monitor, so that gives you an idea of how big this, uh, it's a, it's a ripoff of Pelican case, how big this Pelican case was. So it was 24-inch for the monitor. So it was pretty large, and it had a full-size PC motherboard in it, and I was using uh, USB, uh, PCI Express to, uh, seven USBs to PCI Express um, ports. Uh, two of those to be able to hook up 14 USB adapters uh, wireless adapters to this computer. So essentially, this was a computer in a box, um, a full-size ATX computer in a box with a monitor. Uh, and it ran off battery power. I was pretty happy. I was able to get the whole system, like 12-volt bus, and get everything working. I found a cool DC uh, to DC power supply that did all the adjustments to be able to hook it into an ATX motherboard. Um, and it was a single checked bag. The problem is 25 pounds <laughs> when you're carrying it with your hand is way worse than a back 35 pound backpack. So this thing was a, pa a pain to lug. And the other thing too is, is um, it, there was just a lot of parts to this. 
Uh, and <laughs> yeah, also I, I checked it, so that was cool. I could check it as luggage and um, it wouldn't have to worry about it. So I didn't have to carry it all the way through the airports when I took it places. And this went to a number of places internationally too. So this gave me an idea of, okay, how can I make it smaller, faster, better? So my main goals for building the next project is more runtime, more wireless, more power. So the Kraken, it only had, the original Kraken only had 14 total radios. So that was not like, my previous one had 50. So we went from the Wi-Fi Cactus, which had 50 802.11n radios. This one, the, the, cat, the Kraken had 14 802.11ax radio, or no, AC radios, excuse me. Um, and then I'm like, okay, I need more. So also along the journey that we've had, we also end up with new Wi-Fi standards too. Because why, why, why do they want to keep making new stuff? Well, it's obviously we want to go faster. We want to go faster. We want to go better. But that also means that you got to upgrade your projects, right? So it's like built-in built in obsolescence. So let's get down to the nitty-gritty of what the Kraken Light is. The Kraken Light uh, features an Intel Nooks. So this is my second project using Nooks. I love Nooks. Um, oh, yeah, this is a video. Watch this. Let's see if it works. Yeah, we're getting interactive here. Uh, so the Intel Nook, I really like the Intel Nook. It's a great form factor. The nice thing about the Intel Nook is uh, it has an NVMe slot, which exposes a PCI Express 4X lane. Uh, it also has a hard drive controller for a solid state hard drive. Um, and then it also has a built-in wireless. It has built-in Bluetooth. It's just got a lot of really nice things into it, into a small form factor. The other nice thing, too, is that I can throw 32 gigs of RAM in there. So a lot of the, the applications that I use uh, take up a lot of RAM. They use a lot of RAM. It's very important to have a lot of RAM. Um, Oh yeah, we can keep playing this. It doesn't loop automatically. That's all right, let's we'll keep playing. Uh, and then the other parts of this that are really cool is I added an RTL SDR from Nulek, um, which is gonna be, I'll talk about what we're doing with that in a second. Also found this really sick GPS transceiver, if you, or a GPS receiver. If you're looking for the best GPS receiver, it is this one. Uh, it is a Transystem GM3N, and it has 99 channels, so that means you're getting all of GLONASS, you're getting all the Russia GPS system, you're getting at, like basically ev anybody that's doing GPS, and it's 10 hertz, so it syncs super fast. Um, and then also, I've integrated a 14-inch laptop display, uh, which I don't have hooked up right now because I'm hijacking the HDMI, but it's an ultra-low power uh, laptop display, so it came out of an HP laptop. I found a little cool converter board on eBay. There was like 18 bucks to be able to take LVDS, which is what the laptop outputs, uh, and turn it into HDMI. So I can have, again, because I love to have the screen built into it. It's like, it's like it's the, a cyberpunk little laptop, right? Like I can literally put this on my lap. I've put it on my lap while I'm driving, well not while, while I'm driving, but while I'm out driving, I'll pull up the side of the road, pull over the laptop and start hacking on it. Um, and the other thing too is, is the previous version of this, the Kraken, before the Kraken Lite, it wouldn't even fit on the passenger seat in my WRX. Like it wouldn't fit like to be able to war drive. This fits nicely. I can glance over quickly and make sure I'm collecting data. Everything's really nice. Uh, and then it has 20 amp hours of lithium ion battery because everything's got to be battery powered. Uh, that's the most important thing. Oh, and it's running Pen2. So um, anybody heard of Pen2 before? It's kind of like Kali, but it runs on Gen2. Uh, it's maintained by um, uh, one of the founders of the, uh, the RF, ha well, the, the originally called the Wireless Village at DEF CON, uh, now called the RF Sanctuary. Um, helps develop that and they're, they've got a big focus on wireless so there's a lot of drivers and software that's pre-built into Pen2 so if you're looking to start with wireless projects Pen2 is an awesome uh, distribution to get started with you're gonna find all of your same tools you've got in Cali there but you're gonna find a ton of pre-built in radio stuff built in it as well uh, let's see Oh, cool, that started the video. Okay, real quick though, I wanna talk about some of my lessons learned because there were a lot going to this small box. There were a ton of lessons learned. One of the biggest things that I learned is we have a ton of different uh, drivers 
in Linux kernels for PCI Express. So one thing I don't know if I mentioned back on here, let me highlight it. There's 25 wireless radios in this box. There's 24 on, on carrier boards, uh, and then there's another radio in the Nook itself. And they're all on PCI Express. The way I'm able to do this is I was able to break out from the PCI Express slot in the, the NVMe, not the PCI Express, the NVMe slot where you'd normally put like a solid state hard drive, and then connected that, and then the second way I got access to PCI Express is through Thunderbolt, using Thunderbolt 3. Thunderbolt 3 exposes another 4X PCIe. So I'm using two directly to the CPU PCI Express slots at 4X each. Uh, so those are the limiting factors in the bandwidth. Whereas the previous Kraken, it was limited by uh, USB 3.0. This one is closer to the USB bus. So in that process, the bad things that happened are Different Linux kernels support PCI Express differently, depending on the version, and they're patching it frequently. They're making tons of changes. So what I found is on one of my Nooks, I had a different Nook, a newer Nook. It was actually an 11th gen Intel. I ran into an issue where it would allocate too much header space, and it would only then be able to give me device uh, access to five devices. Even though I had 12 connected, I could see 12, but in dMessage, it kept showing it would crash. So that's like a combination issue of driver issues, and Intel only provides the bytecode for these Intel wireless adapters, uh, the binary driver, basically. Um, and it was crashing, and so I couldn't do anything about it. And it was also a problem with the, the Linux headers, uh, excuse me, the Linux kernel, uh, not allocating enough memory space for these drivers. So it was like, okay, well, who do we point the finger at? Well, Intel, are you gonna fix your driver? No, because it's an open source project and they only provide binaries, so there's no source, nobody knows what's going on. So it's like, okay, well, can we do anything in the Intel or in the Linux kernel? And it's like, kind of, but most of the people that work on Linux kernels aren't gonna listen to some guy that's trying to build a wireless project with 25 other radios, or uh, 12 radios, or yeah, 25 radios, because a typical use case is max two radios, and it works for that, right? It's like, <laughs> no, we're not building you some crazy edge case. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> you know, we've got, we've, and the other thing too is I ran into issues with intermittency, where radios would show up on and off, on and off, I finally found a stable configuration w that I've got here to be able to get everything to show up. Now the ugly part, like I said, the newer Intel uh, CPUs and Linux just are terrible when you have tons of PCI Express devices. I don't know why, I don't know what's, what's the problem is. And then the final thing that I learned is I had this really cool, it was a uh, Chinese uh, knockoff Nook um, that had two NVMe slots and which would be really neat to be able to do that, but it didn't have Thunderbolt, it didn't have a bunch of other things, and uh, sadly that device did not work with this configuration. So what I found is 8th gen Intel is the best Intel to be using with Linux for PCI Express if you want maximum compatibility. Real quick, let's talk a little bit about the software of what we've got going on here. So like I said, I said we've got Pen2, uh, shout out to Zero Chaos, uh, on, on Twitter, he's the, one of the founders of the RF uh, Sanctuary, uh, maintains that. Uh, super awesome, go check it out, uh, give it a try, throw it in a virtual machine, plug in some radios and, and watch how awesome it can work for you. Uh, Kismet, my, all of my projects since their inception, well, except for the very first one I used uh, AeroDump uh, and didn't know what I was doing, uh, have used Kismet since then. Why? Because Kismet is the de facto just epic software to use for wireless monitoring. It began as a war driving net stumbling app for, for Wi-Fi, and it's really matured into a full wireless monitoring package. You can add an SDR to it to be able to start capturing um, all sorts of things in, in Kismet now. Uh, including like ADSB, like you can, so you can watch, you can capture your airplanes flying over your head with it now, uh, as well as the Wi-Fi. So uh, huge shout out to Kismet, um, Wireshark. I love Wireshark. Uh, everything that I capture is, goes to PCAPs. PCAPs or it didn't happen, right? Um, and then uh, I wrote a tool called PCAPinator. Uh, that's the GitHub address. 
Uh, if you want to go and contribute to it, I'm sure it's not the best uh, written the best, uh, so I could always use some help writing some tools on there. But basically the idea of it is if anyone ever tried to run Wireshark with large files, it's super pain. It becomes very tedious and hard, and as you're running it, uh, it's just slow. And so what you do is you run a bunch of TCP dumps all at the same time is the solution that I've found. Seems to be the best one. Uh, and that's what pcapitator does is it's a multi-threaded, uh, multi-processor supporting true uh, threading uh, application of running multiple TCP dumps at the same time. So that way it speeds up um, uh, speeds up your ability to do uh, TCP uh, or uh, PCAP analysis. Uh, and some new tools that I'm using this year uh, with this box is GQRX. Uh, GQRX is a software to be able to do, um, it just it's a generic uh, software-defined radio, radio receiver. So what it does is it allows us to have a waterfall graph, and I'll show you this tool here in just a few, and be able to just kind of shift through the bands and see what's going on there. And it has a, some built-in decoders, like there's an FM decoder in it, so that way you could listen to, uh, listen to the radio if you wanted to uh, with your $40 uh, SDR. Um, and then uh, the last tool that I use is GNU Radio. This is really the Army, uh, Swiss Army knife of RTL SDR or radio tools. And it's basically you add block diagrams, you can create decoders, you can create uh, just all sorts of things in there. Um, and my interest in this is I've wanted to use uh, or I've wanted to learn more information about LoRaWAN. LoRaWAN is something that's uh, really interesting to me, so I've started doing some monitoring with LoRaWAN. Uh, basically, LoRaWAN, it stands for a long range wide area network. Uh, is, I think that's what it is, long range, yeah. And basically it runs at 900 megahertz um, and LoRaWAN is a technology that uh, people are trying to use for IoT devices. So, and it gets up to like 250 kilobits per second. So it's low bandwidth, but IoT devices. And what people are doing is they're taking their, I, uh, their LoRaWAN gateways and plugging them into their home networks or plugging them into the, their corporate networks. And so my hypothesis that I'm testing is that there might be ways to uh, uh, access these networks over LoRaWAN connections because they may be coming trusted because they're hooking their IoT devices. So, all right, a little bit of disclaimer. Uh, some of the data from this year is gonna be a little bit uh, less than in previous years. Uh, the goal of my, my projects recently have been trying to find more specific pieces of information and not necessarily broad capture like I have in the past. I used to measure like in hundreds of gigabytes how much data uh, I, would tr I would try to capture, and this year, not so much, so let's bring the expectations down just a little bit. Uh, and also, I didn't go a whole lot of places. So basically, I caught data in, in about two places. So around Utah, got about 20 gigs with this thing, and down in Vegas, about 100 gigs. And all those other places, I didn't get to go to theirs. Thanks, COVID. Screw you. Hopefully here soon, though. Hopefully we've got lots of plans. Those were all places I was supposed to go over the last year and a half. Anyways, uh, so in the data set, uh, one thing that I thought was interesting is uh, there is about 88% that's encrypted. Now, what's fun about that 88% is probably 50% of it, about half of it, uh, was at Black Hat. And if anyone's ever been to Black Hat before, you know that Black Hat plus the year is the Wi-Fi password that everybody shares. So in theory, 50% of that is no longer encrypted. Uh, we just got to go decode that. So yeah, we'll, we'll look at that later. We'll look at that a little bit. Uh, and then I found 11% unencrypted. And th th there wasn't really much that was interesting in the unencrypted. Mostly it just is management frames and uh, DNS because why not? Why, why do we keep using DNS in the clear? Especially multicast DNS. I don't know. Why is multicast? Like, yeah, I get it. It's easy to do airdrop and stuff. But I don't know. Jim's iPhone, that's important for everyone to broadcast. Uh, some stuff that I saw uh, in the wild at, at um, DEF CON that I thought was interesting. Some DOS in the wild. There was only six. I only caught six. Mac. Granted, I only captured data for probably about, like, four hours, five hours, compared to years past where I'd be running my equipment 24-7 and trying to soak up as much 
uh, ban uh, attacks and things as, as I could. But it was about 239,000 packets uh, of DAUTHs that I saw coming from six unique MAC addresses. Evil Twin attacks, they were launching about 33,000 uh, probe requests or uh, probe responses, and that was coming from about 42 MAC addresses. And there was probably about 10 or 15 of those that they still had their uh, default um, Wi-Fi pineapple MAC address. I don't know, people just love using the 001337 MAC address for some reason. Uh, and Broadpone, uh, this is a callback to a talk from a few years ago. Uh, Broadpone was supposed to be the most devastating uh, Vu uh, vulnerability that ever existed affecting 20 million devices. Still zero, still zero, seen it zero times, haven't seen any real effects of that devastating attack. So go uh, things with uh, webs, go, yeah, vulnerabilities or uh, what is it called? The things that have websites. All right, so let's do, let's switch over now. We're gonna go ahead and uh, do some live. We're doing it live. Maybe? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so one of the really cool things about Kismet, so I wanted to show you. So I went and captured data um, from DEF CON, uh, and so this, that's the list here is some of the data from DEF CONs. You'll see some of the dates and also some of it war driving, preparing for DEF CON. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and load one of these files back into Kismet, and it'll be like we're going back to Vegas. So I'm bringing you to Vegas with me. So what we can do is if we just write Kismet, Kismet, it's hard to type, dash C, and then we're going to grab one of these files. Let's see, where is one that's decent but not too big? 08, wait, that wasn't right. How about we just copy and paste? That will be, I'm sure that's a winning strategy. Whoever came up with copy and paste was a genius. And we'll go ahead and paste this in. And what's gonna happen is it's going to load that data source, that Kismet data source. So. Kismet stores information in these .kismet files. One thing that's really cool about the .kismet files, you'll see here there's all the MAC addresses being reloaded into the system, being replayed. There's also a flag to replay it in real time so we could see it as it was going out. So let's say you go on an engagement, and I've actually done this, gone on an engagement, gone walking around, war drived around the engagement, and then I wanted to go back because I'm like, oh, I don't remember where or when I caught this. You replay your entire capture that you did and let it go in real time. But right now, it's just loading this as fast as it possibly can. Let's see here. So as this is loading, we'll get it all loaded. There, I need to move this so I can see better to do this. There we go. Do, 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 do. Local host. So if you have Kismet, uh, fire up your Kismet client and then pull up your local host. So right now, right here, it looks like the Black Hat Arsenal, which I don't know if any of you set up a Black Hat Arsenal uh, around here. Uh, maybe this is somebody's access point, but if you look, it's actually from August 5th. So this is from Black Hat. Uh, and so just like that, we're able to now see data from the past, from what we were looking at, and we can start doing some analysis. So what do we know about this? They were using Ruckus Wireless. Checks out, yeah, uh, that's what they use down there at Black Hat. Uh, we can see the channel. We can see what type of data and management frames were set, the LLC slash management frames. Uh, we can see how many there was. We can also look at uh, different wireless clients that were connected to this. And we can also look at related SSIDs as well. So just like that quick, reloading the data, it's, we can go back and do post analysis. So this is super handy, super useful. So we can also see that we had clients associated. So let's just jump over and look at a client really quick uh, and see what we can figure out about that. We can see that it's an Intel device based off of the MAC address. Um, we can see that they were on 5.5 uh, gigahertz. And it's maybe possible that we may have seen that person probe, make some probe requests. This one didn't catch any probe requests. Uh, but that could, like, let's say there was a situation where somebody was hiding their SSID. Uh, if we waited long enough, I bet we could figure out what that SSID is, because at some point, there's going to be a probe request for it. So hidden networks are not secure. And we can see that it was a client behavior of this. If there were more client, like if it's 
switched, excuse me, between different access points, uh, we could see all of the access points that it switched to. So this was just a random one I've just pulled up quickly um, so that uh, that way I could show you. So that should give you an idea of uh, like how crazy powerful uh, Kismet is. Uh, just that quick, we can load it, we can bring it up. But I know why you all are really here. Somebody out there is thinking, this guy doesn't really have 25 radios in here, does he? It's like, all right, well, let's do the, the IW config. Oh, please be there. I just, I didn't even look beforehand. <gasps> <laughs> just kidding. I think. <laughs> oh, I know why I'm doing it. Oh, it's, yeah, it is. There we go. I was using the wrong command. Can't type. Typing is hard. There we go. Okay, who wants to count them? Anybody want to count them? Raise your hand. You want to count them? So we've got all these wireless devices. So let's do something with them, shall we? We've already got Kismet running. Let's go ahead and close it, but we need to launch it with all of our other devices, uh, kismet-c and wlan. So we're going to go ahead and launch so we can start doing some stuff live. Got to take advantage of all of those wireless radios. So one thing that's really cool too, OK, so one of the problems that this device fixed from the wireless Kraken, so with the original wireless Kraken, um, it was over USB, and one of the problems with USB is devices on the USB bus apparently block each other in Linux when they're communicating with each other. So when I had 14 devices on the USB bus and I would want to request changes, hardware changes, it would block each other and lock up the software, and there was huge issues. And one of the things that I would love to have done in the other Kraken is come in here, and I can look at the data source. So I'm looking at WLAN 0 right now, and I can lock it. So let's say um, I'm doing reconnaissance. I'm looking over all the wireless that's in use, and I found that there's one access point that I want to target because I know that this channel and this access point is the one that's going to get me my pay dirt. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to hit lock. And I'm going to lock it to channel 6 because I know that I'm going to see a connection. So now I'm going to de-auth that person with my Wi-Fi pineapple or my other device, uh, de-auth that person, watch them disconnect, and then reconnect. And as that happens, I'm monitoring on the channel. I'm watching that whole connection process. This can be helpful when you're trying to do like Meep Hammer, uh, where you're trying to do uh, like crack uh, uh, MS Chap connections, uh, basically WPA2 Enterprise uh, wireless connections. And you're capturing all of this data directly in Kismet. Um, for later analysis and also for then breaking. So I just saw something rad pop up. So one thing that's neat in Kismet 2, we have this St. Con wireless network, and it just showed up in red. And as soon as we get that red, something awesome just happened. And what happened is, is that means we just caught the handshake. So somebody just connected to the St. Con wireless network, and we were able to capture their handshake. So, and one thing that Kismet enables is one-click download of the PCAP file for the key exchange. So just like that, I have the whole key exchange that happened thanks to someone connecting to there. So I could go take this down. Yeah, yeah, shout out to Dragorn for adding that. That's freaking dope. So I can now take this downstairs to Metacortex down in the GPU cracking, the, the password cracking village, take him this PCAP file, and he can start cracking it instantly. So <laughs> I didn't even intend on showing that part of it in, in my demo here, and uh, it just kind of fell together. So yay, shout out to uh, that. Let's see. I thought I clicked to open in Wireshark. Let's see if it actually opens. Oh, well. OK. So let's see, what's next? Uh, let's see. Da, 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 we showed that. OK, yeah, let's talk about, um, I'm not going to get GPS indoors, uh, but I can, I think I can show you uh, the uh, GPS cat and just show you, or let's see, GPS mon. And, Oh, nope, it's not. Something's messed up with it. Anyways, can't show you the GPS, probably because we don't have a fix inside. But it is really fast, so uh, find me later. We'll do the GPS. But let's check out GQRX. 
GQRX is a really fun tool. Um, if you're just starting into wireless, I would highly suggest just go download GQRX, get a wireless, uh, an S RTL SDR, plug it in, and start just figuring out what's in the airwaves around you. So I'm going to push the play button, which should start this recording. So right now I'm looking in the 433 megahertz spectrum. So this is just creating a waterfall. So we're seeing a couple of spikes. Basically what this is just showing us is signal. And it, this SDR, this particular one, only has 2.5 megahertz of bandwidth, which means we can only see 2.5 megahertz of spectrum at the same time. Uh, and right now we're looking at between 432 megahertz and uh, 434 with our center channel on 433. And the reason why I'm looking at 433 because that's where IoT devices live. So had I had an IoT or somebody here, there's actually something, there's, there's this little weirdness that's happening, this little peak area here between 433, it's like centered right on 433 and a little bit above. This might be something that's communicating. So now what I would do is I would go into the other software, uh, GNU Radio Companion, um, and then I would do, let's see, where is that? Let's see, where are you? Pen2, radio, and GNU Radio Companion. So then I would come into radio com G GNU Radio Companion, and here, I'm sorry it's so small. I don't know if I can make it bigger. Um, one of the fun things about open source is they always, accessibility is the next stage. <laughs> you get it functional first, and then they go in and add the things to Zoom. And I'm still a noob at this. So then what I would do is I'd come in here and then tune my channels. Uh, this is basically a block diagram that's looking at uh, the, taking the, the data from the RTL-SDR, and then it's decoding it using a LoRa receiver. So somebody has been generous enough to write an open source receiver that will decode LoRa. So, um, and I need to stop this one really quick, and then I can launch this one. Let's see if it compiles. I uh, checked it yesterday, and we should be good. Uh, maybe not. Well, that's what happens. Sometimes I don't know why that one's running, but basically what it's going to do is it's going to actually take this signal uh, and then process it and try to decode it and see if it would be something. Um, so I'm not familiar. I'm not sure if there are actually any devices here in the in the uh, in the area that are LoRaWAN or LoRa devices. So um, yeah. So basically, this is this is something that I'm working on. This is something new to me. Uh, I'm trying to get further and further down into the radio uh, the, the the radio spectrum, and and so the next pl place to be is right here in waterfalls, and then decoding these things. So look for more of this from me in the future. This is me getting my feet wet. And this is something that you can do like relatively cheaply. Like you can even find RTL SDRs for as cheap as $18. I believe they've got some downstairs in the in one of the villages. I'm sure, I know in years past I've seen them. You can just plug them in, start playing with them, start you know, tuning different frequencies and start seeing what's happening in the, in the wireless around you. And that's the way that these, that's the way you know, these type of boxes happen. That's the way you know, these projects happen is you know, get curious, get out there, get doing stuff. Uh, let's see, you talked about those. So now the next part that I really wanted to talk about that I'm super happy to talk about is the community. So as I started this project, I would thought, I, uh, not this project, but all the projects, all the years that I've been doing this, uh, I thought I was alone in wanting to know this. And then it turns out, you know, there's people like you that want to find out more, that want to know this too. And so I found a bunch of like-minded individuals. I had people come to my talks. And then I've met more people at different conferences. And it seems that there's like just a genuine interest in understanding and demystifying the black magic that is wireless. And so what I wanted to do in this talk today, because I, I have been blown away with what I've seen all of y'all working on, it's I wanted to share some of the cool projects that people have shared with me. I've seen a number of these in person, but some of them, it was the first time I saw them online. And I want, what I want to do is I, want, I, I hope that this inspires you to go build a war driving box, build a rig, grab a Raspberry Pi, make it collect wireless stuff, even if it's like just probes, if it, even if it's just like basic stuff. 
go try it because that's the type of things that you're going to learn about and it's going to help you really understand what's happening in the area around you. So Amelie Fox has created this wireless device. Uh, this one's really cool looking. I have no idea about what the specs are or what's going on on this. All I can do is based on visualization. So up here in the top, there's a really cool keyboard. I actually have this little keyboard. They are such a pain to type in. But if you used to use the old, um, oh, what was those, the, the sidekicks, the T-Mobile the sidekick, like these are perfect for you. This is exactly what you want. And it has a little touchpad and arrow keys and everything. Uh, and then display, built-in display. It looks like there's a power supply down here. Uh, and then they've got pigtails running off to their wireless antennas. So the antennas are coming out of the box. And they're using the same box that I am, the Apache. So uh, if you want a cheap entry option to start building boxes, uh, like really rugged boxes, Harbor Freight for the win. Uh, these things are solid. I think they sell them as gun boxes. Uh, but I've been a big fan of these Apache boxes. This, I think they're like about 20, 28 bucks, I think, for this size. Uh, so, and you can see here, Amelie Fox has done this one. This one blows me away. So uh, I got to see this one in person at uh, DEF CON. This is from Aramont, uh 2001. And this is just a monster of a box. Like all of these antennas up here, that's just, and then the cable management, like that's something I really like need to improve on is like my cable management and my layout. But they're running all USB in here. This is all USB and it's going to four Raspberry Pis. So it's, it's quite an interesting take on it. I never thought of using um, multiple concurrent Raspberry Pis, but essentially that's what my cactus project did is it took all of the cat, all the, all the individual pineapple tetras and fed all that data back to a to a Intel Nook as the remote node. Here, they're doing the individual, um, the individual uh, USB wireless adapters, and then they're syncing all that data back uh, when, like, offloading it from the unit. But they're capturing on four different devices at the same time. And uh, funny, uh, strapped it in for the war drive. Got to make sure you got the seatbelt on your, on your, on your equipment in the back there. Uh, this is this is a rad one. So the one on the left over here, uh, basically what you have is a simple phone, like a, a, a tablet Android device that appears to be running successfully Kismet. Uh, and then they've got the wireless adapter over USB connected to the USB hub, and then the, the cute keyboard to go with it. This is by far the smallest, well, second smallest, um, Kismet setup that I've seen for war driving. So this is this is a USB device plugged into a phone. Really cool. And then on top of that, on the right, uh, is drone. So that's one thing I want to do for the future is add more wireless monitoring capabilities to drones. I keep finding all these gated communities, and I just I just get bored waiting for someone to drive in and out of the gate to follow them in. No, just kidding. I don't do that. That was a joke. Um, so I'll just use a drone and fly over their house, that, <laughs> collect all the Wi-Fi that way. Uh, this one's from Dustin Finn. Another uh, Apache, uh, the Apache mo or the Apache uh, case. Um, and uh, as you can see here, they've got the. Uh, the, the, the bunch of wireless adapters. These are all uh, 802.11ac wireless adapters. Um, these are, this is a really cool setup. And then the antenna's coming out of the box. Uh, for me personally, I like to keep my stuff a little more concealed. Well, in previous years I haven't, but this one I wanted to be a more discreet, a uh, little more uh, self-contained. Uh, uh, and then here's another one from Jay Hewittnet. Uh, this one, this one I think takes the cake for smallest. This one's using two ESP32 devices uh, to record data onto, I believe, SD cards, and then has wireless adapters coming out of it. So this one, uh, you wouldn't be able to do full frame. This one's probably just a Wiggle device. Uh, how many people have heard of Wiggle before? So Wiggle is a war driving software uh, that runs on Android. I would encourage everyone to go to their app store right now. And well, if you're on an Android, you have to be on an Android. Go search Wiggle and join and start war driving right now, you can start grabbing pro requests. So this would be a war driving rig for that purpose. Uh, and then there's the, the masterful Lozani 
Lazaning has created this case, and anyone that uh, flies frequently might recognize the center pitcher. He's uh, got this set up in a, uh, or they've got this set up in a uh, Delta uh, Sky, uh, uh, Delta Sky Club. So <laughs> that's pretty rad. And then th- their new project over on the right is amazing. It's going to be a watch a watch monitoring device. So there is the absolute smallest. So this stuff's really inspirational. People are doing just insane stuff with their wireless monitoring projects. And I mean, we've got just so cool tech. Uh, And then shout out to Monkey Dragon. Um, I do a podcast and we just had a talk with him uh, last week on the podcast. And uh, this is his rig. It's got a uh, external wireless antenna. I envision that this system is going to be actually integrated and mounted into his car before too long. Um, time? How much time? I, I, that was time. 15 minutes? Roger, roger. Okay. Uh, and then there's Mr. Bill, uh, another. Oh, there, there's this group called the Hard Hat Brigade. They take hard hats and modify them into wireless monitoring devices and then add some flair to it. Uh, Mr. Bill is the uh, originator of the Hard Hat Brigade, uh, but this is his war cycling rig. So he takes this bike around uh, where he lives in a populous city on the West Coast. And uh, yeah, it, that's all it is. It's just throw some, throw some hardware in the back of a bike, throw a GPS on it, and boom, away you go. Um, and then we've got Dialu, a.k.a. Ryan. <laughs> Uh, and they've taken a clean approach. They've got uh, a very nice output display. You know, they've got the, the two uh, display, the two um, line, um, what are those called? Displays. I don't know. <laughs> Basically, you can get them on Adafruit for like 18 bucks or 20 bucks. And then connected that into another system. They've got batteries and they've got the antennas out. But then also the antennas are external, so it looks like it's hooked onto their car. So this is definitely a war driving rig. So really cool stuff. Uh, and then we've got the Viox. Uh, and what we've got over here, again, another box. You're starting to see a, see a theme here, right? You see the radios thrown in a box. You've got batteries. You've got your antennas. Uh, and then you've got the duck, of course. You always have to have a duck. And then this also is a war driving rig. How do I know? Because there's the cigarette USB, or uh, uh, not USB, the 12 volt cigarette lighter. So it looks like conversion system built into there so that they can pull the, the power out of there. And then finally, this is one of the most professional looking rigs that I've seen. So this one is using um, uh, these boards from uh, uh, Alftel, a guy out of uh, Canada that's making these custom boards that have wireless radios built into them and then bunching them all together. <laughs> so this is a complete board. He sells them on Tindy. You can go check him out. Look at Alftel on Tindy. Uh, that's actually where I got my carrier boards to be able to hook up so many PCI Express devices. And then on top of that, uh, there's custom antenna arrays. And these are actually properly spaced. So I just have an antenna block that I had my friend Weston uh, put together and 3D print for me, and I just shoved antennas in it. If I was an actual radio guy, uh, then I would probably make something that that looked like this. It has proper spacing and antennas look really clean. Uh, and that's really cool. I love this. I love this design. So uh, we're getting kind of short on time here. So let's talk about what the future is. So I, this is what I want for the future. I want to be cosplaying as the guy on the right there. I uh, got my antennas in the back, you know, uh, doing some rage uh, radio uh, direction finding stuff. I uh, got my Yagi gun BFG 9000. Yeah, I'm gonna cosplay as this. See, you know, this is this is this is where I'm this is where I'm going. Obviously, you got the bodyguard. Uh, yeah, at a minimum, I'm cosplaying as this next year at DEF CON. All right, and with that, let's uh, let's open it up for some questions. Yeah. TSA has been extremely easy. They just keep putting these little slips that say your stuff has been uh, inspected. 
Uh, so I haven't had any problems. The people that do freak out is the customs people coming back to the United States. Uh, they think that I, like, especially when I came back from the Bahamas, they thought maybe I had met with someone offshore and am smuggling this back in and trying to get into, like, uh, some sort of, uh, I don't know, government installation with it. Uh, I had to do a second round of screening and go through it and open it up and explain it was for research, and then I had showed them some articles that were written about my projects, and but that was the only problem I've ever had. I even, even going into China, I thought going into China would have been problematic, but uh, it was not. It was not. It was coming back to America that was the problem. Any other questions? Yeah. What do you do with the gathered data? The, the, do with the gathered data? Uh, the question is, what do I do with the gathered data? So right now, I've mostly been, like, I do analysis and then do interesting analysis and then try to in include it in talks and then try to give examples of, like, this is bad network uh, setups. This is problems. This is why you should use encryption. This is why everyone shouldn't use the same password. This is why you should use a VPN if you're on an open hotspot. So use that for that type of stuff. Also show some interesting statistics. But this year... Thanks to this uh, company that got breached, uh, what was their names? I don't remember, but they were a DNS or a, a hosting company that got breached that also is a VPN provider. Uh, they uh, leaked a bunch of VPN keys. So now I'm going to go back and look through my data and see if I've ever captured any of their VPN data because now I can decrypt that based off of the leaked keys. So data hoarding for the win. So I'm a little bit of a data hoarder. So yeah, uh, gonna look to see if there's any sort of correlations. Because at this point, I've got almost five terabytes of data I've captured over the years. So uh, it's not a ton of data when you consider like a network tap or something like that that's capturing everything directly on a wire connected to it. But for just some random guy passively sniffing stuff at conferences, that's quite a bit. So other questions, yes. A great question, and I totally should have addressed this, didn't even think about it. Thank you for bringing that up. The question is, why is there so many radios? The point of having so many radios is if you have just one radio and you're trying to listen on the channels, right now with 802.11 AX or Wi-Fi 6, there is about 93, 94 total channels, including 40 megahertz and 80 megahertz wide channels uh, and 160 megahertz channels. Uh, widths. And so what's going to happen is you're going to be jumping across every one of those channels. And as you're jumping across it, you miss the conversation that's happening. Granted, with the 20 megahertz channels in the 2.4 gigahertz, there's really only three channels, 1, 6, and 11, that really matter because those are the center channels and they're 20 wide. But there's always the people that set them to non-standard channels, so you're going to start missing that information. So the point is to add a bunch of devices because so that way I can listen to all of those conversations at the same time. Also, too, if you have a network s situation where you have transient devices, devices moving between access points, people roaming, you'll be able to see those whole conversations as they happen because you have more devices to capture that information. So it ultimately came out of a need, or a, of me determining that I had a bunch of fragmented packets and I wanted more. So, and then I just took it to an extreme with the cactus having 50 radios. This one has 25, but also is significantly smaller and easier to carry. So, yes. So the question, I think, is uh, am I pre-configuring each of the radios or is it hopping? How is that? How does that process work? Is that the general gist of your question? So uh, in the Kismet software, uh, in the Kismet software, it actually has the ability to take advantage of multiple radios, and it will automatically stagger those for you. So right now, I locked in the demo, I was locking this to channel six. On the other radios, they're all scanning on all of the channels at the same time. So they're hopping, because I still don't, I don't have enough radios. I don't have the 90-some-odd the radios that I would need to cover everything. They're still hopping, but they're hopping in a block. And I think I can show you that if we come over to current. We can see, you'll see that this 
uh, oh wait, yeah, I think that's it. Hold on. Basically what happens is that it's going to be like uh, bouncing across here and we'll see moves in it. So yes, I'm still missing stuff, but I'm catching significantly more than I was. And once I know I have a target, I'll lock channels to that and then it no longer hops on those. So I'll fix it to like one, six and 11 and I've got 2.4 gigahertz covered uh, like when I'm doing an engagement. Does that make sense? Yeah, exactly. So the, the mostly I do like an analysis and figure out what my you know most interesting targets are. So here, if I was doing an attack on SaintCon, I would go through and figure out where all the APs are, and then I would try to lock on as many of those APs that are within range at the same time. So that way I could monitor what's happening and try to look for handshakes, try to look for data leaks, try to look for that. Because being locked on a channel is going to give you the most full picture. Um, but in, in a busy environment, I mean, we have a few hundred attendees here. I don't know how many people are at Saint Con this year total, but we have a lot, and DEF CON's even bigger. There was 10,000 people this year at DEF CON, and so when you have a big environment with lots of APs, lots of moving pieces, I want to see as much of that picture as possible, because I didn't go in with, like, an objective. I'm not hacking, you know, a certain access point. I just want to see as much as I can, so, yes. Yeah, absolutely. So the question is, do I have any problems writing to disk? Uh, yes, that has always been a, a thing that I've done. So in the previous Kraken, I actually had RAID 0 on two hard drives to be able to keep up with the two PCI Express devices. This one's using a, a single um, SSD inside of here that's able to keep up with the 4X PC or 8X PCIe bandwidth. So the bandwidth becomes like, where is the bottlenecks? And every year, that, that was the biggest bottleneck with the Cactus was the Hack5 Pineapple Tetras only have 100 megabit Ethernet ports. And so I had gigabit Ethernet switches, so that was the bottleneck there. So yeah, I've definitely gone through and looked at uh, where the bottlenecks are and, and tried to eliminate those. So um, I think I'm, do we still have a few more minutes? I can go, I can keep going. You guys, they say I got three more minutes, so we can take another question. Real quick, I just wanted to plug my Twitter. Uh, follow me on Twitter. I've got a, a Twitch channel. Uh, we stream typically every Tuesday. We're doing uh, this show called The Wireless Shit Show. Me and my friend Kentaro from Japan. Uh, we're both uh, war driver enthusiasts. Come check us out Tuesday nights at 9 p.m. Uh, Mountain Time. Uh, Instagram, uh, if you want to stalk me on Instagram, feel free. And also my LinkedIn if you want to reach out and then my GitHub. Uh, I saw a hand over here. I would, I would recommend you use what you already have uh, for starters because like get your feet wet with that. If you have a laptop, install a virtual machine, use VirtualBox, it's free, grab Kismet, um, and then be able to use the existing stuff you have. If you do have a budget and you're like a limited, super limited budget, I would say then go buy a Raspberry Pi 4. Buy a Raspberry Pi 4 and a wireless radio. You're set back maybe like 50 bucks, 60 bucks doing that. And then you're like, okay, well, what's next? And then you're going to buy batteries, and then you're going to buy more radios. <laughs> and then the addiction just happens. And the next thing you know, you're just buying all sorts of stuff, and you end up spending. I'm not even going to tell you how much I spent on this. Uh, actually, I will. It's about 1800 bucks, But uh, <laughs> totally worth it. It's amazing. Um, yeah. Thank you for your question. Other questions? Oh, so Alpha makes some dope stuff. The problem is, is I'm a sucker for latest gen technology, and I wanted to make sure I was capturing in Wi-Fi 6, um, and Alpha currently does not make a card that supports Wi-Fi 6 and also has open source wireless monitoring drivers. Uh, and these Intel, Intel, they've released a binary driver, but it's supported by the open source community and does monitor mode, so I can do full capture. Uh, with the Intel. So Intel AX200s are the chips that I use, the PCI Express chips. So, yes. Other questions? Other questions? Other questions? Other questions? We have literally one minute, and then they're going to come up here and, like, tackle me, is what I heard. Anyone? Anyone? All right. Well, let's call it. Thank you so much for attending my talk. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.